giddy up, y'all. It's so nice to be here. From the way Doug Keck talks, you're going to start to get the impression that I'm some sort of troublemaker. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> this afternoon, I'd like to speak a little bit about some reflections from the gospel that we had today and emphasize certain parts of it that I think are going to be helpful to understand ourselves. We heard in the gospel from Luke chapter 12 that our Lord Jesus said to his disciples, I have come to set the world on fire and how I wish it were already blazing. There is a baptism with which I must be baptized. And how great is my anguish until it is accomplished. Do you think that I've come to establish peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. These are odd words. And in certain ways, if we're not careful, we could take these out of the context of what Jesus said and how he said it and what he meant and make it into something contrary to his doctrine. Now, one part that we have to see as key here is that he came to have a baptism, and he's in anguish until he experiences that baptism. That baptism certainly refers not to a washing in water, but being a wash in his own blood. Because the baptism of which he speaks is his own death and passion, his sufferings. Later again in the gospel, as well as in the other gospels, he spoke about his death as being a form of baptism. A baptism, the, the Greek word baptizo means, uh, usually refers to a, a ship that is sunken and gets waterlogged. Bapto is to sink, and baptizo means to be waterlogged. And he is going to be, in that sense, waterlogged, immersed, bathed in suffering. And it's not going to be in the process of Jesus Christ imposing somebody else to get suffering, but he will stand back and he will receive that suffering from them, silent like a lamb, exactly as Isaiah the prophet had foretold 540 years actually 570 years before Christ suffered. And this kind of suffering, he warns, is not only going to be his. He lets his disciples know very clearly and very well that it will be theirs as well they too will engage in that suffering. Now, this is important as a starting position because when our Lord speaks here that I've come to set the world on fire, how I wish it were blazing. Do you think I've come to establish peace? No, I tell you rather division or sword. And I wanted to start off with his awareness of the suffering he would undergo meekly and like a lamb led to the slaughter. 
because Christians do not take this passage out of context and try to assert that we should set other people's churches on fire. We do not use this to assert that we should go and wage war against other religions. This is not the case. And that's not what Christ wanted us to derive from that. Now, as a little side point that I'm sure many, if not most of you have heard, I even ask you to raise your hands. How many of you have heard it said that religion is the biggest cause of war in the history of the world? Raise your hands. About all of you, right? I only hope that the people who say that are merely ignoramuses and not liars. I hope they're not lying. I'm just hoping that they're too dumb to know any better. And I'm going to recommend that you, I'll, I'll give you some of the data, but I want to recommend all of you to go check it out yourselves, where you can go to the University of Hawaii's website, www.hawaii.edu. And when you get there, I forget this specific part, there's a slash, but there's, uh, what you can just do is look up demo side, like the word democracy, which means ruled by the people, not by dictators, but by the people. And democide means the murder of the people. And when you look that up, you'll see the charts they have about the wars of religion, the wars that were fought in the name of Christianity, but also They'll give you data on the wars that were fought in the name of secular ideologies. And they will give you the list of wars and the tally of the dead when wars were fought in the name of atheism and to promote atheism and also the attacks by governments against their own people to wipe out the opposition in the name of atheism. And what you will find, they do some of the adding for you. They've got great charts. Name of the war, period of history, all that's laid out. And in the 2,000 years of Christianity, where they include the Crusades, where one million people did die in a 250-year war. So many died, one million. And they will give you the number of people who died in the Inquisition. It's about 285,000, I think, a little less than 300,000, over a 600-year period. And they'll give you the other wars related to Christianity, and it adds up altogether to 7 million people. I do not commend that, because I do not see going to war in the name of Christianity as a virtue. And I don't recommend it. And for the most part throughout our history, there really has been great restraint. But when you tally up the wars in the name of secularity, you can see 
that the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars were already a couple million people. But between 1914 and 1990, we see many millions more. 20 million in four years of World War I in the name of nationalism. There was nothing religious. As a matter of fact, what those governments did under Otto von Bismarck in what was called the Second German Reich, or in Italy and in the, Ru the Russian Empire and the British Empire and the French Empire, and the Turkish Empire. These empirical nations did not fight in the name of religion. What they were telling their people is that your commitment to the state supersedes your religious commitment. Your commitment to our people, to our nation, or to our government, depending on which country you were in, to our czar, to our Austrian emperor. Those commitments were more important than your commitment to the church or to God, and that the state should supersede religion. And in the name of that, 20 million people died in four years, three times as many as died in 2,000 years of Christianity. Now, which, which idea is more dangerous? the idea of the supremacy of the state or of the people or nation or the supremacy of God. Which one is more dangerous? Then, of course, in the name of National Socialism and the push of the empire of Japan, 50 million people died seven times as many as died in 2,000 years of Christianity. But in the name of atheistic communism, especially not so much under Lenin's ideology, but Trotsky and then Stalin made a strong commitment to eradicating faith in the name of the idea of socialist communism, and atheism, and they wanted atheism to eradicate belief in God. And 61.9 million people were killed by their government of their own nation, of their own people. Not in war. The state attacked its own people. The estimate keeps going up, but they, at this point, they think at least 75 million people were killed in the name of atheistic communism in China. In Cambodia, it was only 2 million, but that was half the population being killed in the name of atheistic communism. Now you tell me, who is the dangerous force? Religion or atheism and secularism and socialism and communism? These are the real dangers. And I've gone to the atheists' blogs and they talk out of both sides of their mouths. On one hand, they will be the ones promoting that Christianity and religion in general is the biggest cause of war, when in fact that's not the case. And they'll blame all the wars on the teachings of the Scripture when they're related to religion. But when atheists try to promote their atheistic ideologies and kill tens, in fact, a couple hundred plus million people 
in a 76-year period. Then they say, oh, but that doesn't count because atheists didn't do it in the name of atheism. Yes, they did. Read what the different dictators said. Well, then, if those atheists saying we want to wipe out religious people in the name of atheism, that doesn't count as being an atheist war, then the Crusades doesn't count as a religious war, because I disagree with that, too. And I don't like it, so you can't use it. Either you accept that the seven million who died in religious wars are, far, are numbered by those who died in the name of secularism and atheism, or you then say, well, it's no fault of religion that those wars took place, just like it's no fault of atheism. Make up your mind. Does your belief lead you to bad actions or not? And this is something extremely important because they try to use this as a weapon against people of faith who don't know history, who don't look it up, who don't know that these charts exist at a secular state university, University of Hawaii, not a religious organization, not a Catholic school, not anybody school except the state. And they're just trying to give historical facts. And people who don't know those facts say, well, that is dangerous to be religious, when it's the opposite that's the case. It's dangerous to be an atheist and a secularist. And we then have to say, look, we are not here to set fire to the earth the way the atheists and secularists have set fire to the earth in their wars, their world wars, their mass executions, their gulags, their concentration camps. Oh, they'll say, Hitler was raised Catholic. Well, a lot of you atheists were. Are you still Catholic? Or have you repudiated it? Because his, Hitler hated the Catholic Church and repudiated his Catholic faith. If you don't count his repudiation of faith, then we won't count yours. So put some money in the collection. <laughs> no. These are the kind of things we have to realize that we don't set fire to them. We set fire in another way. And this is one of the things that we must understand. Christ approached his disciples with this, as we see St. Luke say. And he wanted them to be set on fire with this new empowerment from God, with this gospel that Jesus was teaching. He wanted them to be set on fire with the Holy Spirit. And it is no accident that St. Luke wants us to see a direct link between St. John the Baptist saying, the one who comes after me will baptize you with the Spirit and with fire. And then he says that I want you to be set on fire. And then on Pentecost, flames as of fire come upon the heads of the disciples in the upper room. And these folk who were afraid to step out of the room are set on fire to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not with the sword, not with burning down Roman temples or synagogues, but with the truth of what they speak about Jesus. And that this fire that Christ set on the earth was such 
a power in their lives that they saw the truth of the gospel as being more important than their own mere survival. These same disciples not only preach in Jerusalem, and some are killed there, like St. Stephen, the first martyr, St. James, the brother of John, the first apostle to be martyred, but also they go to the ends of the earth exactly as Jesus had told them, exactly as he desired in this text. I've come to set the earth on fire, not Jerusalem alone, not Judea or Galilee alone, not only Samaria, but to the ends of the earth, as he told on Pentecost, on, on the Ascension. And they go as far as they could before they're killed. From Spain to India, from Egypt up to what's now southern Russia, northern Iraq. They preach all over the world. And it hasn't stopped. And that this fire for Christ has spread from them and continues to spread today. Now, the purpose of this is not going to be to review some of the positive things happening in our world today. Though I'll mention a couple. For instance, are, how many of you are aware that there are between six and eight million Muslims becoming Christian in sub-Sahara Africa every single year. How many of you heard that? <laughs> and this is at risk to their lives. There are terrorist groups that attack them. Churches are being burned. Christians are set on fire with the love of Jesus Christ, with the gospel of his truth. And they go forth, and they're winning people over. The response all over the Muslim world is to burn their churches. 60, 70 churches have been burned in just the past couple days in Egypt. Coptic Orthodox, Coptic Catholic, the Franciscan Church, the Jesuit Church, Adventist, Baptist, but mostly Coptic because they're the majority Christians. Between 60 and 70 of their churches have been burned just in the past few days because the military doesn't get along with the Muslim Brotherhood. And so what do they do? Burn down the Christian churches. And the response I've read from the Coptic priests is, they can burn down our churches, they cannot stop our faith in Jesus Christ as the true Lord. This is what our brothers say. When Boko Haram, a group in Nigeria, gets moving there and they attack Christians. They've taken Christians and put, especially men, they put tires around them so they can't move, and then they set them on fire. This is how they, in their hatred, set fire on the earth, and yet it doesn't stop people from sharing the faith, and they see the Christians may be endangered and they may be killed, but they keep coming to faith in the Christ of the gospel. Because the people of Nigeria and Mali and 
other countries throughout feel that fire of Christ that sets them on fire, not with tires and gasoline, but sets them on fire with the love of God, the love of their neighbor, and the truth of the gospel. This is not something of the Roman Empire days of hundreds of years ago. This is days ago. A friend, just a few weeks ago, a Franciscan priest was killed in Syria by Islamists because he was trying to protect nuns from being attacked by these people. This is going on constantly in Iraq. Churches burn on a regular basis in Pakistan and elsewhere. And still in China, many of our Catholic brothers and sisters are experiencing terrible oppression from their government. We have to be aware of that because this kind of reaction is one that Jesus speaks about when he says, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Not because he wants to instigate violence. That is not the purpose of our Lord. Nor does he want us to instigate fights and violence and harass others. That is not righteous. But rather, he is aware of the truth of what goes on in the world. The forces of evil do not take the attitude of live and let live. They do not have the attitude, well, if you want to be a Christian, you do that, and we'll do what we're going to do. And we'll just leave you alone, you leave us alone. That is not their mentality. From the time of Cain and Abel, evil reacts negatively and violently against that which is good. So by the very fact that Christ brings his gospel by the fact that he tells us the truth about authentic human life, human morals, what forgiveness is, how mercy from God restores our dignity and how we cannot expect to receive mercy and forgiveness if we are not willing to show it to others. that this is necessary, and if we hold those positions, forces of evil will not sit by idly and merely let you do your own thing. That would be a totally naive reaction. Again, as the Coptic Christians, they were not going up against anybody. They're not a political party. They don't have guns. They don't have an army. They're trying to live their own life, and 60 to 70 churches are burned, and many are killed. It's been going on for a while. This is also something that we must be aware of in our own nation, in America and in Europe and other Western countries as well. We cannot afford to be naive about this. In our society, it is typically popular to try to hold to a relativistic thought, a relativistic principle, which states there is no such thing as objective truth I have my truth, you have your truth, and all we'll do is just learn to get along. I'll leave you alone, you leave me alone. That would be their form of relativism. 
However, as anybody who studies logic would tell you, to say there is no absolute truth is itself a claim to be absolutely true there is no truth. That is an inherently in itself without any other possibility an illogical position. You cannot assert there is no such thing as absolute truth with such absolute certainty as, abs as relativists do. And the reason that it's not just to make fun of the illogic of their position, but it's to warn about their own blindness to being so absolute. They are so sure there is no absolute truth that what they must then try to do is say, well, this is going to be the way it is in life. We're going to impose this on everyone. They don't realize that absolutely holding there is no absolute truth blinds them to the ways they will necessarily try to impose their ideas upon us. But here's the risk. Relativists say that you have your truth, I have mine, right? That's what their general position is. That means there is no outside truth in between us. There's no absolute truth, objective truth that you and I can recognize and then use as a basis for discussion, disagreement, or debate. If I have my truth and you have your truth, how can we disagree? with any kind of logic. There's no principle for disagreement and, of course, no principle for resolving our disagreements. And disagreements exist in life constantly. But most of you are married. Why am I telling you that? <laughs> Even driving in a car you need objective principles so that when you come to an intersection, you know which car has the right of way to go first. You must have some principle for that. If you don't have stop signs, stop lights, or other rules, then you will end up dealing with the true principle that relativists impose, which is might makes right. If you don't have any ideas that you share, if you don't have truth in common, if you don't have an objective truth between you, the only way to resolve your problems is that might makes right. And if might makes right became the rules of the road, you would soon enough see the wealthy driving Sherman tanks. That's the only way they can make sure they get through the intersection. And the rest of us are probably going to have to stay off the road. So also for relativists, they will use whatever form of power and rhetoric rather than the sharing of what is true as a way to get what they want. 
They will claim, we won this election, we got this, and even if they lose the election, they will do other things. We'll use the court, we'll use this principle, that. We will get what we want. We demand what we want, and we will get whatever form of power it takes to get that position in place. And that becomes a dangerous, dangerous world where might makes right. And there's no other option in a relativist world. What we are called to do by today's gospel is let Jesus Christ set us on fire with a love for the truth because it is true not a love of the truth for what I can get out of it, how much money I can make, how much power I can acquire, how many of my enemies I can get back at. That's not why we love what is true. We love it because it is true. And it puts us in perspective. That's why a Catholic is not committed to a movement or a party or any ethnic group or racial group or any other kind of organization more than a Catholic is committed to the truth so that I use the truth that Christ reveals as a way, first of all, to reflect on my own life and, dare I say it, judge my own behavior. My call is to judge what I do as right or wrong according to the truth of Christ first and always examine my conscience before I deal with anybody else. And then I will also apply the same principles of what is true and morally right to my friends, to, to my opponents, to people who agree with me and disagree with me. Not so that I can win talking points on a so-called political discussion, which is really various folks on the right and the left jamming ideas down their throat in propaganda for the audience's sake, rather than a careful analysis of what's right and wrong. No, I want to understand what is true, because it's true. And I want to be set on fire with that love of God that keeps me committed to the truth and spread that. And I think we also need to understand that this reality of doing that will bring the division. We won't instigate the division, but the fact that we stand up for what is true is going to cause others to oppose us. Pay attention to the way the unbelievers speak about us. They insist that all religious people are haters. If you disagree with their politics, you must be a hater. This is one of the dirty words they like to use. Or you are judgmental. That's another dirty word as far as they're concerned. And they will use this kind of language about us because they do divide themselves against us. This is part of reality. 
And we should not be naive about it. We should instead seek more deeply into what is true to be able to stand up to it and even when they use their necessary technique of might making right, when they do try to use force against us because that's all they've got instead of ideas and reality, we are going to be more committed to the reality, more committed to God, and more on fire for the truth of God. We won't do what I think too many of us Catholics did in the sexual and drug revolution of the 60s and later. We did not stare them down. We said, well, maybe they've got a point. Maybe they're right. Well, how did that work out for them or us? With the drug culture leading to so many tens of thousands of deaths by users and dealers and cartels. How did that bring about the peace, love, and joy of 68? Ask them in Mexico how well that's working out for them as 60, 70,000 people are killed by the cartels. And then their solution is, oh, we'll just make it legal. That'll st as if that will stop the violence. Hardly. How'd that sexual revolution work out? When we went in 1960 from 5% of children born out of wedlock till today, 41% of Americans are born out of wedlock. How'd that work out? And of course, 25% are infected, infected with sexually transmitted diseases. Last year, the Center for Disease Control said 100 million people were treated for diseases. How's that working out? We didn't stare them down. We didn't stand up strongly enough for Christ. We said, well, whatever. Well, it's different. It's their thing. They can do what they want to do. And that was the music, and that was our attitude. Today, Christ calls us with a yearning to set us on fire for the gospel, to set us on fire and to stare down those that call us haters, but stare them down with the love of Christ, a love of truth, and a love of them. To stare down those who are destroying families with a love for them and a love for the children God wants to bring into the world through them and a love for family relationships. To stare down when the government tries to force us to commit mortal sin by paying for sterilization and abortion and contraception. We're going to stare them down with our rights as citizens and the truth of Christ and a love for them too. This is going to be a long, long task. It has gone badly for the last 40-some years, and it's going to be problematic in the future. But we don't depend on ourselves. That fire is not mere emotional enthusiasm, but that fire is the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is the task that we have. And that is the gift that we seek from Christ. And that will be what we share. Thank you. Thank you.
have a few minutes for some questions and comments. I'll start off with this young lady there at the front. Ma'am, where are you from? Albuquerque, New Mexico. Beautiful town. Yeah, I love the Mexican food. Favor, Jesus Christus. Siempre. Oh, no way. Oh, Christus, all right. Yeah, Amen. Jesus Christus. Amen. Yes, you have a movie, So, what's your question? Um, first of all, I want to thank you for your Jesuit zeal for knowledge and education. Well, thank you. And I wonder. <laughs> And I wonder if you have any more series planned for like Threshold of Hope, mm -hmm. uh, but kind of like the information you gave us here today. Okay. So first of all, I also want to thank you for my Jesuit education because it was the people of God who by their gifts to the society made it possible for me to go to school. And therefore, therefore, my education belongs to you. You've given it to me so I can share it with you in the church. That's how I look upon it. And, you know, all your generosity to the various communities and orders and dioceses, this is what you're doing. And I hope that, you know, you, you support the various orders and dioceses so that we can get good educations. I appreciate that very much. Plus, you know, I went to the 27th grade and going to school beats going to work any day. <laughs> but in terms of more series, uh, I'm going to continue teaching on, you know, threshold. And as I do that, I shouldn't bring these things in. And I'm also working on new books. Some of the material I'm talking about today is going to go into my next book. We haven't got, we've only got a working title on that. I have to finish up a book this uh, coming week, and then I can start another one on this topic after that week. So uh, we'll, we'll try to keep coming out with it so that you all can learn it and bring it out there. Bring the information out there. That's one thing we want to do here at EWTN. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Father Mitch, and thank you for your powerful work here today. Thanks. Um, with reference to your talk this afternoon, what commonalities or similarities can be found in looking at the non-practicing Catholic versus the atheist? You know, I haven't seen too many studies of you know, that show one way. So I can't point to something that says non-practicing Catholics and atheists are such and such. But overall, my impression is that non-practicing Catholics have a lot of the same patterns of behavior in certain measurable moral things as the general culture so that non-practicing Catholics have about as much divorce, contraception, and those measurable events uh, as others. And, you know, I, th those are the only kinds of studies I've seen compare Catholics to uh, the general culture, not to atheists. Because, you know, the, the atheist sample is still fairly small. They're vocal and they're mean but they're not, they're not big in numbers, okay? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Father. My name's Andrew. I'm from Corpus Christi, Texas. I love Corpus Christi. My question to you is, we live in a society that tries to dictate or define what we as Christians should be, and we live in a society where the government is trying to dictate to us the type of Christian that we should be. Mm -hmm. At which point do we push back, and at which point do we fight back? The point, so the point at which we push back should have been years ago. We're coming late to this game. And that's why you see politicians who start now to talk about freedom of worship in America. 
Don't fall for that. Freedom of worship is what the Constitution of the Soviet Union guaranteed. And what they meant by that was, when you are in church, do whatever you want, but don't bring it outside the church. And there are legal organizations, pseudo-Christian organizations, pseudo-Catholic organizations, and politicians who want to reduce us to freedom of worship. The Constitution says that we have freedom of religion as the first freedom mentioned in the Bill of Rights before freedom of speech, before freedom of assembly. And on that point, be alert. The Constitution does not say there is a separation of church and state. That is not there. What the Constitution says is that Congress shall not establish a religion nor pass any law to interfere in the practice thereof, such as mandates to force us to commit mortal sin. They don't, that's what the Constitution says. The separation of church and state comes from a quote of a letter by Thomas Jefferson, 1804, 1805, in which he said there's a wall of separation between church and state to protect the church from the state, not to, to protect the state from the church. And then a former member of the Ku Klux Klan of Alabama was appointed as a Supreme Court justice by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. His name was Hugo Black. Now they made him renounce his Klan membership. He did not renounce his Klan hatred of Catholicism, and in a decision made against letting any state funds go for books that could be given to Catholic school and to riding school buses, he introduced Thomas Jefferson's letter, and he said in that decision that there's a wall a separation between church and state. That's where it got promoted. And all I like to do is point out that the ACLU is approving of and promoting a position from a Ku Klux Klan justice on the Supreme Court. Let them have it. Hello, fa hello Father. Um, how are you doing? Fine, how are you? Fine, where are you from? Uh, I'm from Carmel, Indiana. Good to have you. Thank you. Um, I've got a question regarding modern day atheism, yes. and I'm alluding to something that the late Pope John Paul II, I believe he said before he became Pope, regarding, could, could you uh, allude to the fact that maybe today's atheism is more or less an anti-God, the anti-God versus God that uh, the Pope uh, spoke of? I think he might have said before he was Pope. Um, but I, I just want to know if you want to allude to that so much that maybe they don't so much believe in God is that they do believe in God, but they're against God. Okay, I understand what your question is. Yes, I would agree with that. It's not so, as a matter of fact, when you read a lot of the new atheist movement, Christopher Hitchens and a variety of others, Richard Dawkins, they are more angry at God, they hate God. I mean, Dawkins calls God the wickedest character in all of human fiction. It's a quote. Christopher Hitchens said, um, it, it just as part of his vitriol, Mother Teresa of Calcutta was the most evil person of the 20th century. Think of her competition. <laughs> she had Hitler, Stalin, Mao Zedong, Pol Pot, and she won. <laughs> That's not something based on logic. That's vitriol. And I was talking to a young man before this talk 
uh, rec- and he already had gotten this book, and I want to recommend it to all of you as a way to begin dealing with these new atheists. I strongly recommend a book called The Last Superstition by Edward Facer. The Last Superstition. It's amazing. He understands their positions, and he refutes them brilliantly. And that's what we have to learn to do. They may not listen, but we're going to teach the truth anyway, because Christ sets us on fire to set his fire on the earth. Thank you, and God bless you.